Good day, y'all. I'm Oscar, and welcome to News Hour. As the show's host, and this being our very first episode, let me take this opportunity to give y'all a brief introduction to and overview of our channel. News Hour is a philosophical channel in both nature and scope, and our aim is to bring different perspectives into focus with the goal of broadening our listeners' minds. On our channel, you'll find two different types of content News Hour Presents and News Hour Reviews. News Hour Presents is a philosophy show featuring guests from various backgrounds to explore topics of philosophical interest, and News Hour Reviews help one to navigate both the academic and non academic marketplace by covering various philosophy articles, blogs, books, and resources. I'll also just mention how episodes of NewsHour Presents are structured. Episodes consist of several Q&A segments, each of which is followed by a famous word segment to get our guests' reactions to relevant quotes. And we'll close shows with my take on the topic at hand. Additionally, on the NewsHour blog, you'll find our out-of-print blog posts, which feature our guests' book, movie, or song recommendations. And now, without any further delay, NewsHour Presents Philosophy as a Way of Life. The view of philosophy as a way of life goes back more than two millennia to a time when different philosophical movements, or sects, founded their own schools that developed into distinct philosophical traditions, like Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Taoism, to name just a few. Despite their differences, they all taught philosophy as a way of life. So, what is philosophy as a way of life? Well, that's where we'll begin our show, starting with a more general exploration before acquainting ourselves with specific traditions. Enjoy the show. Our first guest is Marta Faustino. She's a member of the Melon Philosophy as a Way of Life Network and earned her doctorate in philosophy from the New University of Lisbon. She's now a research fellow at the Nova Institute of Philosophy, where she coordinates the Culture Lab's Art of Living Research Group. She's given lectures and taught summer courses on philosophy both as a therapy and as a way of life. Welcome to NewsHour, Marta. Let's begin with a description of philosophy by Bertrand Russell. In his book on the history of Western philosophy, Bertrand Russell said that philosophy occupies a sort of no-man's land in between religion and science. How would you describe philosophy? Well, as you know, there are many possible descriptions of philosophy, but my favorite one is still probably the ancient traditional one as love of wisdom, provided that, of course, that it is clear what the ancients meant by love, philia, and wisdom, sophia. So the love or philia that is at stake here denotes an erotic tension towards something you lack and need above anything else, something that is almost inaccessible and yet you strive to achieve your whole life, which is wisdom. And this wisdom was conceived not simply as something that makes you know more, but as something that deeply transforms you and your way of being, something that enlightens you, something that brings about the conversion to a completely different way of life. And in this sense, then, philosophy is above all an existential choice to live in a certain way, or in other words, to devote your whole life to that pursuit of wisdom that is involved in the philosophical way of life. All right, and what distinguishes philosophy as a way of life from other conceptions of philosophy? Well, the main distinguishing mark of philosophy as a way of life is precisely that it is a practice, not a theory. That is, according to this uh, model, philosophy isn't something you simply learn, but something that deeply changes your way of being, the way you relate to others and yourself, and the way you perceive the world and inhabit it. In a nutshell, the knowledge you acquire shall be incorporated and translated into a way of life. It shall transform you rather than merely inform you. I think this is the basic difference to other practices of philosophy. And what do you think is driving the growing interest in philosophy as a way of life? I believe believe this growing interest comes from a certain frustration of what philosophy became in the context of modern universities. Uh, Philosophy is taught and learned today as a purely theoretical and abstract discipline with no impact on people's lives, their behavior or their character. So teachers are mere dispensers of information, so to say, where your students are treated as consumers. And this means that philosophy has lost its deep connection to life and to the big existential questions that I believe are still what drives people to study philosophy or dedicate their lives to it. Philosophy as a way of life promises not simple accumulation of knowledge, but transformation of one's being and improvement of one's life. And that is indeed becoming more and more appealing because it very directly answers to the basic human need to find meaning in life and some orientation in it. 
And how is philosophy as a way of life related to the therapeutic view of philosophy? Well, the idea that philosophy can be therapeutic goes back to ancient philosophy and especially during the Hellenistic period when philosophy was explicitly presented as a therapy of the soul. It was based on the assumption that we human beings are fundamentally ignorant in the way we lead our lives and tend to be wrongly persuaded by common sense and generalized opinions. As a consequence of this, even though we all naturally strive for happiness, we are unable to attain it and thus continu continually fail to reach the end to which we naturally tend. Philosophy was then presented as a kind of technique, art or craft that was specialized in human life. It was called the techneto bio, so an art of living. And as such, it was conceived as the only one that was able to cure us from our suffering and orient us towards the happy, complete or flourishing life. So these therapies involved first an understanding of what it means to be a human being, what is our role in the whole and what is needed to make our life happy or complete. And from this understanding, a set of prescriptions and exercises were derived that concerned every possible aspect of human life, including diet, exercise, control of desire, management of emotions, an attitude towards fortune, preparation for one's death, and so on. So individuals were asked to follow and practice these precepts continuously throughout their whole lives, which is why during this time philosophy involved a kind of conversion and took the form of a total way of life, a way of life that promised happiness, completeness, and tranquility of the soul. Then with the, with the emergence of Christianity, philosophy handed over its therapeutic function to the church and strictly speaking, it never recovered the form of a therapy of the soul again. But this does not mean that it completely lost its existential orientation and therapeutic potential. Many modern and contemporary philosophers have in different ways reinvented the ancient model of philosophical practice. And in as much as they challenge our perception of the world, as well as our, as well as our acquired habits, values and beliefs, and provide us with different alternative worldviews, they can still have a therapeutic effect uh, in our lives. I believe it depends on how we read them, how we let them penetrate our life, and most importantly, how we let them challenge us and transform our way of being. All right, and what societal role does the philosopher have to play? Yeah. Well, I, I would answer to that question in a, Foucauldian med, in a Foucauldian manner, saying that the role of a philosopher is always to change something in people's minds and show them that they are freer than they think. As much as our freedom might seem or actually be restricted at times, there's always a realm that we can control, which is our character, our will, our way of being and behaving in the world. This was also the perception of ancient philosophers. So if a philosopher manages, manages to challenge common sense, our fixed habits and beliefs, our firm opinions and worldviews, and in addition to that, he manages to open up the horizons of thought and promote concern for oneself, self-cultivation and self-transformation, as I believe any good philosopher does, then he or she will already have achieved a lot in societal terms. One popular conception of philosophy is in a sort of armchair theorizing setting. Is this a misconception? Might not philosophy also take place within a social or communal setting? Well, in a way, philosophy is always a lonely act, or at least it involves moments of solitude. It is in solitude that you find yourself, that you enter in conversation with yourself, that you realize what is wrong with you and your life, that you eventually find a disposition to change. And of course, solitude is in general also needed to focus your attention on whatever philosophical problem that is concerning you. But at the same time, philosophy, philosophy also involves exchanging ideas, letting one's own position be challenged, and eventually learning with other fellow philosophers, which is why the philosophical community is also important. The Hellenistic schools, so, such as the Stoics and the Epicureans, often formed communities as the best way to achieve spiritual progress and share a common way of life. Everybody was welcome. The only condition was a commitment to that particular way of life. And what are some philosophical exercises that, as Socrates may have put it, can help one to better care for one's soul? Well, yes. Uh, ancient philosophy is full of spiritual exercises or techniques 
designed to help the transposition of theory into, pra into practice, that is, of a certain philosophy into a way of life. And the aim of these practices was to reduce existential suffering and help people towards good, complete or flourishing life. So examples of these exercises are, for example, a frequent meditation on one's death in order to get used to one's own mortality and suffer less when the moment approaches. The premeditation of, evil, of evils, a stoic exercise which consists in imagining the worst possible scenarios and what would, would be one's feelings, reaction, attitude towards them, so that if something of the sort actually happens, one is already prepared to face it in the most peaceful way. Another exercise is to train one's attention to the present so that one is not disturbed neither by the past nor by the future, which are periods of time we cannot control. To incorporate the distinction between what is and what is not in our power, as already referred, and care only for the things we can actually control. And for example, to learn to view things from above, that is from a distant, synoptic and disinterested perspective in order to suffer less from disturbing events and learn to accept what happens inevitably. So these are just some examples of philosophical exercises that may make sense and help people still today, even if they only acquire full meaning and impact on one's life, if they are practiced in the context of one's commitment to a particular way of life. So my advice would be that people actually read Epicureans and Stoics and so on. <laughs> With the pandemic, global polarization and societal tension, how can philosophy help one to lead a good life even through such strange and uncertain times? Well, philosophy as a way of life, at least in its ancient configuration, teaches us how to lead a good life independently of external circumstances. It teaches us to distinguish what is and what is not in our power, to, fo to focus only on what is in our power and let go of things we cannot control. And in our power is precisely our judgment, our character, our behavior, our assent to theses and opinions. Philosophy gives one skills to enter into a healthy dialogue, listen to different perspectives, but ultimately stick to one's own judgment of what is reasonable to think and appropriate to do. So I think that the development of critical thinking and the trust on one's rational skills and judgment, together with a certain training in keeping peace of mind amidst the most adverse circumstances, are probably the most important tools philosophy can provide for times like this. And now for famous words. From his essay entitled Philosophy for Layman, Bertrand Russell wrote that the pursuit of philosophy is founded on the belief that knowledge is good, even if what is known is painful. Can you please comment on this? Okay, this is an excellent quote in the context of philosophy as a way of life. Actually, ancient philosophers, especially the Hellenistic ones, would not agree with this painful character of knowledge and truth. For them, as I have already mentioned before, the cause, of, the cause of suffering, the cause of human suffering is ignorance. And so the beneficial character of truth necessarily involves a significant reduction of suffering. But it is true, we know that some truths can also be ugly and hurtful, and philosophy as love of wisdom cannot evade them. But suffering, and this is something I consider very important and, and that authors like Nietzsche, for example, have, uh, have stressed, Suffering is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. Suffering makes you stronger, deeper, more conscious, more courageous, perhaps. It also facilitates change and self-transformation. It makes you perhaps look at the world and inhabit it in a different way. So does knowledge and truth. And so the idea is, again, that increasing your awareness, your knowledge, your understanding of the world is always beneficial even if, or maybe because, it necessarily happens at the cost of some suffering on your side that you need to overcome. In short, to embrace philosophy as a way of life and let it transform you is always a good idea, even if it does not immediately reduce your existential suffering or even increases it at least momentarily. Okay. Thank you, Marta, for your time and sharing with us, and I wish you all the best. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Our next guest is Christopher Gill. He's Emeritus Professor of Ancient Thought at the University of Exeter and a founding member of Modern Stoicism. Through his organization and writing, which includes providing introductions and commentary to an important Stoic text, 
the translations of Marcus Aurelius's meditations, as well as his community involvement engaging the public with Stoic ethics as a source of life guidance, Christopher has contributed to the modern revival of Stoicism. Welcome to News Hour, Christopher. All right, so let's begin with what is Stoicism and what's its relation to the therapeutic view of philosophy. Stoicism is one of a number of uh, so-called Hellenistic philosophies, so later than Plato and Aristotle. And it's standardly broken down into three parts, logic, physics, and ethics, all of them very broadly understood. Mostly, I thought that philosophy was both a matter of understanding, of intellectual understanding, and a matter of applying that understanding to your own life. The other relevant factor of therapy or life guidance is uh, a number of Stoic thinkers either presented themselves in through writing or were presented by others in a, in a, in a kind of practical way, in a way that was designed to enable people to apply the philosophy. This is true of Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and also Cicero, who was not himself a Stoic, but, but wrote eloquently about Stoicism. Does Stoicism appeal to us in the same way it did the ancients, or has it been modified and adapted for the modern world? Well, I think there's two answers to that. One is, in a way, these questions are eternal, aren't they? We're human beings. What is, what is, the, what is the purpose of our life? Is, does life have a purpose? Uh, what is happiness? What is the place of, of virtue and happiness? Um, what are human beings and what is their place in the world? And these are fundamental, eternal questions. And so in that sense, Stoicism simply addresses the same questions as have always been addressed. And as long as there are human beings, as long as we don't destroy ourselves, as we seem to be trying to at the moment, the, 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 these questions will still be addressed. In another sense, of course, if you ask me, can you in, um, tw in 2021 be... Um, you know, hold <laughs> Stoicism in exactly the same way as people did in the third century BC. Well, no, you can't, because we can't accept Stoic physics. We don't, uh, I don't know about logic. I think Stoic logic might well still, still be applicable within its own terms of reference. Stoic ethics, on the other hand, I think um, hasn't in any sense gone out of date. There's absolutely no reason now why you can't hold a stoic ethical viewpoint, um, stoic ethical beliefs in the way that you could in antiquity. That's true, of course, of a, a lot of uh, ancient philosophy, that, that it's the, the, the ethics is the, is, is the most, that's partly, I think, why people are turning to, to, to ancient ethics. It's because it, it doesn't <laughs> go out of date, if you like. Separating right from wrong isn't always clear cut. How do the stoics tell the difference or put another way, what role do ethics play in the lives of stoics? Sure. Yes. No. I mean, I think they were a, a perfectly well. Stoics so were perfectly well aware, uh, as we are, as anybody is who thinks carefully about this, that it's not always self-evident what the right thing to do is. Their approach to ethical guidance is, I mean, it's a virtue ethics. So, so what we should try and do, and what development consists of, is ga gaining a better understanding of the of the virtues and of how to apply these. And say so Cicero is on, on duties, which is a very good text from this point of view. Inform yourself and try to learn about the virtues. What are the virtues? For them, there were four cardinal virtues, wisdom, justice, courage, self-control. And these were generic virtues with, with subdivisions. You should learn about the virtues, what, how, what, what, how they form a kind of mapping of the functions of human life. Then you should try and in all the means possible to you through other people, through your own experience, through reading and so on, try and uh, inform yourself about the actions which are characteristic of the virtue. And thirdly, that you should kind of inform that a moral, you know, ethical discrimination with broader understanding of nature, um, not necessarily universal nature, it could be human nature. First of all, what is human nature? And then also, uh, this broader sense of nature. And, and it's the combination of these that, 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 that can give us a kind of framework. But the Stoics also stress very much the idea of development, of progress. 
so it isn't that you kind of you know you kind of do all these things you know on thursday and then by friday you know you're you're ready to go <laughs> life is a process of ongoing learning and progress um, and development through your, the way you take care of yourself and the way you take care of others so there's no simple all right no simple answer you say maybe i haven't given a simple answer but i've given a kind of framework um, within which uh, human beings can 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 navigate their way and and identify what 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 in any given situation seems to be the right thing to do. All right, and how is stoicism related to psychology? I think the most uh, for us the most interesting and, and relevant fact about the Stoics is that they took a holistic view. They didn't separate reason from emotion. Uh, they didn't actually draw a strong distinction between mind and body. They were psychophysicalists, it's all, all one. And they adopted on psychology what's sometimes called a cognitive view. They thought that the beliefs we have will shape the emotions we have and the desires we have. So your belief system, your belief set, shapes your desire, share, desire set. So what you desire at time X, you know, is determined by your overall pattern of, of beliefs um, and what you, what you think is valuable, what you think is worthwhile. So there are early exponents of this holistic cognitive viewpoint that has now, of course, become very, you know, very um, taken very seriously, widespread, um, and that gives rise to cognitive psychology. Um, Martha Nussbaum recognizes this in her book on emotions, the, 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 the Stoics as kind of um, archetypes of the, of the cognitive approach. Um, and it also, of course, gives rise to, uh, you mentioned therapy, uh, there to cognitive psychotherapy. Cognitive psychotherapy, CBT and so on, tends to look back to um, the Stoics and to Epictetus as a kind of, um, as prefiguring that approach. All right, and your organization, Modern Stoicism, holds annual Stoicon conferences, the next one being held on Saturday, October 9th. I'm curious to know who the events are aimed at and what to expect. Uh, these are aimed at anybody but the overall approach is a kind of practical one that is we're not doing academic we're not, not it, it, it's different from what you would do in an academic conference so perhaps more likely that someone might talk about stoicism and relationships in personal relationships or stoicism and parenting or you might have a talk that's about one of these more accessible writers like um, or thinkers, Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus. But the, uh, yeah, there would be different kinds of things. Yeah, so the idea is it's opening the door. Of course, there are now quite a lot of resources, you know, uh, our courses, many books. So it's supplementing that. Um, we, 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 Modern Stoicism and, and other organizations are doing these live broadcasts. I did one recently, a discussion, took part in a discussion on Stoicism and the pandemic, which was online. Um, so, and, and we're having actually a, what we call a Stoic on X, which is a kind of smaller gathering, uh, one on, on Stoicism and the military. And also there's a women, women's um, Stoic on X, um, you might say, well, we don't, why, why do you need to have a special one on women? Well, partly because um, I think there's a feeling that it, perhaps in the past, stoicism has been a bit male centered, it, and the people engaged in it have been, you know, tended to be men and so on. So, so it's quite important that we have, you know, since it's, it's a universal philosophy, we want to have a, a, as broad a base as possible, really. It's not an elitist philosophy. And now for famous words, I'll play a clip of the philosopher Hilary Putnam discussing philosophy over time, and I'd like to get your take on what he had to say. Nowadays, I don't know what I, what I want to say. There's something which is in every time and place. Uh, the role of the philosopher, you know, the subject is uh, goes back to about 500 BC at least, and. Uh, 2,500 years is a long time, and obviously it's evolved, but some things seem to me to be constant. Uh, I think that philosophy is, from Socrates on, has been concerned with thinking carefully about how to live. 
Now, it's been concerned with a lot of other stuff too already. But I think that while philosophy can't be exclusively about how to live, it can't be just narrowed to, say, ethics, that combination of an interest in how to live and an interest in reasoning carefully about it, bringing together these two things that seem so different, close reasoning and a concern with man's place in the universe, the meaning of it all, how to live, this has to remain part of philosophy. I think if I have a worry about philosophy today, is that in some quarters at least I sent in, in Anglo-American philosophy, which has some wonderful accomplishments, but there's a tendency to think that that's sort of optional, that philosophy can become just something like a science. And I think that's an illusion and a, and a, and a fatal illusion. It stops being philosophy when it loses that ethical concern, which I think started it off in some way. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful quote. Um, of course, in a way, it's what we've been talking about all the time, really, because because it's it's philosophy. Okay, philosophy. We're talking about philosophy now. We're not necessarily talking about applied philosophy, but from so the, the Stoics would say you've got to have you've got to have logic. You know, there has to you've got to be the use of reason, the the the, the correct and appropriate re use of reason, the application of laws of logic of rules of argument. That's a dimension. Otherwise, it's just, you know, what is it? It's just people blabbering on. So, you know, logic is very important. But supposing that philosophy is, as it were, doing its work, that it's enabling you, you to understand the na nature, that it's enabling you to understand the ethics and how to live a human life, that uh, philosophy should also provide a, a framework for living. And I, of course, Putnam's very interesting. He draws a contrast, doesn't he, between, as it were, well, a tendency in the modern era, which is just to make philosophy and into an academic subject. Um, it's interesting. I don't know quite when he said that, but yeah. it's it's kind of interesting because mm -hmm. I think I think really philosophy has changed mm -hmm. in that regard. I mean, I mean, I, when I was your age, it was all about the linguistic term. You know, philosophy was all about. You know, philosophy doesn't study ethics, it studies the language of ethics or the logic of ethics. And that's what everyone wanted to do. Um, and since then, thank goodness, there's been <laughs> people who are now actually willing to discuss ethics. <laughs> um, and they're willing to discuss nature, as it were, from a more, more engaged standpoint. Um, and I think that feeling that, that, that the philosophy has to kind of dress itself up as a sign of second order activity you know, is, is, is much less common than, than it was. Uh, again, it, it's not antithetical to that, for there to be rigor of argument, you know, uh, um, uh, but, and to incorporate all the values of logic and, and clear thinking. But, but um, uh, I, think, I think, you know, I think it's, it, it, there's been a sort of general move to enable philosophy or the, some philosophy to connect, to connect with with practice, you know, well, why have all the, the glories of, of, of logic and understanding if they're not also applied to, to human life? So, yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a tremendously stoic point. He mentioned Socrates, and Socrates um, was taken by the Stoics as a kind of exemplar. He had this principle that you follow the argument wherever it leads, you follow the logos wherever it leads, uh, and you live by, by, by that, by the logos. So, and the Stoics thought, Thought in the same way, really, and I think it's a, it's a good it's a good motto: following the logos, following the argument wherever it leads. Okay, well, thank you very much for talking with us, Professor Gill, and I wish you all the best with the Stoic on. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great talking to you. Our next guest is Catherine Wilson. She's a scholar who has held positions in numerous academic institutions, including as the Regis Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Aberdeen, the Anniversary Professor of Philosophy at the University of York, and as the Visiting Presidential Professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She has researched extensively into naturalistic and anti-metaphysical 18th century philosophy and written a book on Leibniz's metaphysics. Her recent research project, Futility and Transcendence, looked into Kant's metaphysical idealism and a priori moral theory. She has also written a couple, a, several books on Epicureanism, and her latest book is called How to Be an Epicurean. Welcome to News Hour, Catherine. All right, so in a nutshell, what is Epicureanism? Right. Uh, well, it's a third century BCE ancient philosophy, kind of contemporaneous with Stoicism. 
but uh, after, after Aristotle and way after Plato. And the Epicureans, um, they were a kind of cult in, in the modern sense of the Epicureans got together. They lived outside of the city in a big mansion with a so-called garden, probably a grove of trees and places to walk. And they were really different from the other sects of ancient philosophy, especially Stoicism. They thought for one thing, there are no gods, human beings just sprang from the earth like everything else. And human beings have created society completely on their own with no direction from above. They thought the world is made of atoms. Everything is essentially atomic in structure. We'll never be able to see the atoms, they thought. Of course, they didn't have microscopes or even lenses at the time. And so the idea is that the cosmos is just a constant re self-reconfiguring set of atoms sticking together. They had a little problem about how they stick together, but that's something for the, the technicians in ancient philosophy to, to worry about. So it follows that everything is, is kind of fragile. Everything will come apart sooner or later into its atoms and have to be reconstituted into something else. So everything that happens, uh, happens because of uh, these reconfigurations. And it follows since there's no divine direction of the world, no heaven, no hell, no moral authority outside the world. Pain is the only real evil, they said, and pleasure is the only real good. This life is all you have, and you should minimize the one. Not necessarily try to maximize the other, because that tends to be self-defeating. But getting rid of sources of pain was the basic thing for them. And how is it related to the therapeutic view of philosophy? What they thought philosophy did therapeutically was to remove sources of fear and anxiety. And one of the sources of fear for people back then was a uh, fear of hell. That was uh, something for our ancestors to worry about. I would say that, well, well through the 18th century for many people, they were really afraid in Christian cultures of being damned and going to hell. Um, Epicureans said there is no hell, there is no heaven either. You don't have to be afraid of that. Um, what you should be afraid of, especially in connection with morality, is how other people are going to react to you if you behave immorally or even amorally. You won't win trust, you won't win cooperation. And I thought you'll uh, suffer the remorse of the bites of, of conscience. So the best way to have a tranquil life is to be pretty regular in your moral habits, for one thing. But they also thought you should, that there are many sources of anxiety and worry, things keeping you up at night um, that are not really necessary. If you uh, are incredibly ambitious or you need to make piles of money, they're going, it's going to bring a lot of worry and, and disappointment, and it will be um, too much and never enough, as Mary Trump said. So you can, you can reduce anxiety in your life by doing things you enjoy, doing things you find fulfilling, uh, but not worrying too much about mainstream values of achievement and influence and power and money. So that was part of their withdrawal idea. Stoics were, I think, much more ambitious. And in particular, they were militarily ambitious. Stoicism's a rather militaristic philosophy. Epicureans were having none of that. So um, therapeutics today, um, I think Stoicism, they're always in contrast, as you know, Stoicism and Epicureanism. A lot of people are very moved by the Stoic idea that you can control your emotions, control your reactions to things, um, that you can always reframe a situation in such a way that you're not bothered by it. And Epicureans were rather skeptical of that. I think they thought emotions are part of life. Strong emotions make life feel worth living. And you don't want to be blunting your reaction to things. You just don't want to be harming people by right? Um, aggressive emotions. 
So the therapy is really a matter in the Epicurean view of understanding the natural world, understanding the social world, thinking about what your place in it is, looking at it very objectively, but um, not, not in an uninvolved way. All right, and what role do ethics play in the lives of the Epicureans? Right. So the basic Epicurean um, principle, ethical principle is don't harm others. And that's because pain is the only evil according to them, and, and pleasure is the only only good. So it's very, very simple. If you just start thinking, instead of thinking in terms of divine commandments, which are sort of arbitrary, except that right, they're the commandments, or even the Kantian attempt to derive rules from reason by generating contradictions, if you do the opposite, you just think, why do certain, um, certain practices or certain things you can do harm people? So that's the basic principle. And the 19th century utilitarians kind of elevated this into their calculus of pains and pleasures in deciding all matters of social policy. That's a little overly simplistic, um, but I think it's still a very useful guide to social policy. Who is this hurting? Who is this helping? Who's benefiting unjustly at somebody else's expense? All right. And in some ancient philosophy schools, philosophy was not only a way of life, but also a shared pursuit of truth. And it's been said of the Epicureans that they in particular prized shared inquiry. Can you please comment on what that may have been like or what it entailed? And furthermore, how that might be applied today in an age of information with sophisticated telecommunications? Right. What I think they meant uh, was that I can imagine them kind of sitting around uh, having something to eat and drink and um, thinking about questions like, can anyone explain volcanoes in atomic terms? And uh, you know, people would come up with their hypotheses and they would get criticized and people would try to think of alternatives. So very like collaborative scientific work today. We've seen what collaborative scientific work can do in this pandemic where with lightning speed, through a bit of competition, but an awful lot of cooperation, right? We've done what people would have thought was impossible before it happened, you know, getting a vaccine out, getting it, getting it understood, in fact, getting many, many vaccines out. So the power of cooperation is not to be underestimated. And all of us in academic life know how much we depend on exchanges with other people. These can be painful because other people don't often think our own ideas are so great. They poke holes in them, ridicule them even. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to discuss with someone who's on your wavelength and sees things the way you do, but can help. In this uh, age of broadened social media where everyone is commenting on everything that happens and on everyone else's reactions, we know what some of those problems are. People get into so-called bubbles or echo chambers. And even though we're all resistant to learning new things and new information when it doesn't fit with what we think we know, um, the problem is, is amplified. But on the whole, I think all these data sharing developments are very positive. Even the slightly illegal ones, like um, you know, being able to download copies of books. I think Wikipedia, even though it has some problems, has been a wonderful resource for academic people. And Google Books, you don't always get the edition you want but the information is, is there and it's free. So I'm a great proponent of having cultural resources be free. And I think the Epicureans would have approved. And now for famous words, I have a quote from Christopher McCandless, an American hiker who was the subject of the book Into the Wild by John Krakauer. McCandless tragically died in the remote Alaskan wilderness. However, he came to the perhaps inspired realization when he remarked that, Happiness is only real when shared. Can you please comment on if this sentiment would have resonated with the Epicureans? 
Well, the Epicurus did say that um, the greatest good is friendship and uh, having another mind that you can communicate with is much better than any other sort of pleasure that you can, you can come up with. And of course, it's always better if you're taking a walk to, or often better, I won't say always, sometimes you like to go for a walk by yourself, but having a companion along to see a movie and talk to you about it, go for a walk or share a meal. Oh, that's really important. And I think that's been borne out by every psychological study. That that's mm -hmm. what uh, gives people real gratification. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on, Catherine. Wish you all the best. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye-bye. And now our final guest for this episode is Robin Wang, who is a professor of philosophy and director of Asian Pacific Studies at Loyola Marymount University. Previously, she was a Bear Grun Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. She authored Yin Yang, The Way of Heaven and Earth in Chinese Thought and Culture, and was the editor of Chinese Philosophy in an Era of Globalization. More recently, she contributed an essay on Taoism to the book How to Live a Good Life, A Guide to Choosing Your Personal Philosophy. Welcome to News Hour, Robin. All right, so in a nutshell, what is Taoism and how is it related to the therapeutic view of philosophy? Put it simply, Taoist philosophy is a nat nature inspired theory and the practice. And it's treated human life as a transformative living. As a therapeutic aspect, we, I can see is trying to critique, to actually bring up a social critique and uh, trying to look in within oneself how to find a, a genuine self and uh, to lead a flourish life. All right, and does Taoism appeal to us in the same way it did the ancients or has it been modified and adapted for the modern world? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty much still the same because um, Taoist uh, uh, teaching a, it's fundamentally dealing with human condition. So human conditions still remain the same. And the Taoist uh, uh, teaching today, you know, 2000 years, this practice, the teaching still can and still uh, sustain. Now the difference, you know, our life is enhanced by technology. So then provide a very different uh, um, way to think about the Taoist uh, theory and the practice, but in principle, still the same. And what are some Taoist practices? The sense of a practice of Taoist is to see, to look, to open minds in the sense of to willing to learn new things and to respect others and respect the environment and have this specific, have, has compassion to the old things. So I will say there is a Dao, um, Dao De Jin talk about there's three important Taoist treasures. One is compassion. This compassion is not just uh, to uh, human beings, but uh, to all beings. Secondly, we see a simplicity. You know, so how we our life can be. What is most important in living? You know, we need to reflect, exam this kind of fundamental questions. And then a third is a humility, to eager to learn and to, to growing. I will say mentally, spiritually, and also physically. And what role do ethics play in the lives of Taoists? So we think about ethics, maybe I would take in, in the Taoist perspective, of course, how do you choose? What do you choose? Um, what is the right choice? So um, the, the Tao, Taoist idea, the right choice, um, is not the only, only choice, right? So, so why the choice come from your examination? Examination the conditions, particularly human conditions. And then if we're going by these three um, treasures, compa com uh, compassion, simplicity, and the humility, that it's become a, a guiding principle to choose, to, to guide what will be the best course of action. 
And then the second one question, of course, we will uh, moral ethics, usually moral uh, theory is about um, judgment. Judgment is to make it is to try to see what is good and what is right. It's wrong. It's to evaluative. So the Taoist ethics for your personal um, behavior and also from social perspective, this kind of uh, evaluative standard come from how this particular action and uh, aligned with the big pictures and in connection with nature or, or whether this is a flow follow the, uh, the way of things operates. So there is specific um, Taoist principle, for example, called the um, self-soul. It's, it's actually in the sense of a spontaneity. So this is in the Tao Te Ching chapter 25. And uh, Tao Te Ching state that, uh, you know, um, human follows modeling uh, earth, earth modeling the heaven, heaven modeling Tao, and the Tao modeling self, so or zizan, spontaneity. So that is actually a suggest that there is a natural state of all things, either in the society, in any institution, in the culture, in you know, every individual. So we want to protect, preserve that um, special state that things be themselves. I would say maybe we can see consciousness of dignity of all things, not just human beings. And we need, and also another thing, this idea is for especially applied to society is a sense of diversity. So we will see diversity is not a goal. Diversity is a foundation of all things. Diversity is the basis of human life and the social structure. And we will see also cosmos. So as a human beings, as a society come together, as a culture and being connected, so how can we see see the myriad of things on their own light? And we respect, cherish the differences, and also we bond by this common good. So I think Usually people think Taoism is a biased view against the Taoist ideas. Oh, Taoism has no way to dealing with social um, problems and just think about just for each individual. But actually Tao, Taoist teaching has provided a very valuable um, ethical insight and also ethical principles. I would say maybe it's not, not principle, not in the sense of propositional, not like Kantian's, you know, category imperative or utilitarian's greatest happiness principle. It's not a propositional. However, they do come up set of ethical orientations, approach. And so this approach orientations actually helps us society to promote um, social justice, equality, and also to see how humanity is work together, bond together uh, to become a better, we see to be better together with ourselves, with society and with cosmos. So that's that's very important. So the artist view, it's not a focus on only yourself and the in individuals. But uh, in many ways, for example, in Zhuangzi, the another classical text to talk about how we should uh, lose our fixed self, but again, cosmic self, to see how we connected with our community, our uh, culture, and our cosmos. So this way of building, so Taoism has this idea of called the Tianxia, that means all under heaven. So, so Taoist way approach social problems 
and is to deconstructing this uh, uh, boundaries and also this tensions. This tension and uh, its result of uncontrollable desires and human desires. So that's why Taoism promoting to, to limiting the desire. Fasting of my more important than know when to stop. To when to stop, that's the highest way to think about the human life. This way, the, the so one of the diagnoses of Taoism given to social problem is ex excess desire. It's excess to conquer to want to uh, uh, get it for me, all about the me, you know, all us, but rather to uh, breaking down this kind of dualistic, polarized way to thinking about the humanity, think about the world, but rather we all together, bounded by compassion, or we can see sympathy, and we work um, together to pursuing Tao. So that's, that's one of, way to think, think about the Taoist teaching. And now for famous words. The late American science fiction author, Dr. Michael Crichton, wrote the following. I am certain that there's too much certainty in the world. Can you please comment on this? Yeah, this is a wonderful quote because the best thing, and one of, I was one of insight that Taoism gave to us is how do we deal with uncertainty? Because the our starting point is not looking for certainty, especially mathematical certainty, but rather the start of worldview is uncertainty. So world is all uncertainty. That's its given fact. This is the first proposition, then assumption. Then from here, you will see, okay, within this uncertain world, what should we do? Then we have used our cognitive ability, our, you know, our body, everything else, trying to find the uh, way to serving this uncertainty cosmos. So, so this is, way. so that's why I, I, I have the Written a book called Yin Yang, The Way of Heaven and Earth in Chinese Thought and Culture, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So I will take a Yin Yang. So, so I'm teaching this Yin Yang symbol. It's the idea of Yin Yang symbol. If people say, oh, you see, it's so cool, it's perfect, um, uh, symmetric idea. It, it's not about the symmetry. It's about how, first of all, the symbol itself is a spiral. And also, Yin Yang is a human best ability to grasp this uncertainty of the world, and not just the world, our life, our body, our you know, the future, and uh, everything else. So that, that is in a, it's a way to go about it. And then, so at the same time, this also we can enjoy the whole journey. You know, if you know it's just the cause effect, straight the line, you know, it's become deterministic, but the rather, the world constantly unfolding mysteries, surprises, and then you have a better way you prepared because you have a certain kind of mental um, tool to deal with uncertainty by learning about the Tao's teaching, learn about the yin yang, and then you have a great fun. And they, yeah, it's also talk about the, uh, the wonderful. Uh, life is it's, 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 uh, in, enjoyable. This joy directly come from uncertainty. Okay, so thank you for coming on, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. All right, so although I endorse the view of philosophy as a way of life, an endorsement alone is not enough. So I'd now like to take the next step and also become an advocate for that view. I'll begin by just sharing a little bit about my education and experience as a philosophy student before speaking about philosophy more broadly. At the start of my studies, as was likely the experience of many others, my mind was very foggy about which subject to pursue, and although I was interested in philosophy from an early age, my decision to specialize in philosophy at university wasn't what I initially intended for myself. So, when you're confused, you often look for some sympathy amongst your perhaps equally confused peers, whom you mingle with in the dining halls. There, I befriended some inspired science students, and when I confided in them that I'm considering philosophy as an area of specialization, I was immediately advised to reconsider. 
They ridiculed philosophy as being useless and left me taken aback by their hostility towards a subject which, after all, gave life and so much more to theirs. Anyway, their efforts of pressing me against taking philosophy had the unintended effect of making me stick with it. What I learned from studying philosophy was that, contrary to some people's opinion, philosophy is not useless, and to show that, I'll give you all a quick overview of philosophy, as I understand it, before considering a personal example in order to illustrate how an understanding of philosophy can be applied to and improve our thoughts, lives, and society. The philosopher Eliot Sober, in his popular Intro to Philosophy textbook, Core Questions in Philosophy, suggested, I think correctly, that unlike how with some disciplines for which ordinary people's understanding may differ even drastically from how specialists understand their own subject, the good news about philosophy is that, generally speaking, Ordinary people's understanding doesn't fundamentally depart from how philosophers understand philosophy. We all have a philosophy, and by this, what we mean is a set of important but difficult to prove beliefs about how we see and understand both ourselves and the world we inhabit. Now, suppose that a stranger approached you and claimed that he knows where he is, but has no idea how he got there. You might suspect that he's suffering from a medical episode and in need of some medical assistance. And yet, when it comes to our beliefs, at one point or another, we're all bound to find ourselves at some belief without remembering how we ever even arrive there. Philosophy challenges us to resist accepting a sort of intellectual amnesia about our beliefs. The artist Pablo Picasso said that computers are useless, they can only give you answers. And what I think people fail to appreciate about philosophy is that philosophy is as much about the journey as it is about the destination. Perhaps some people are resistant or even hostile to philosophy because they know that the journeys can also be bumpy and emotionally disturbing, and so when it comes to their most important or cherished beliefs about how they see themselves and the world they inhabit, maybe it's just not a journey which they think they'll enjoy taking because they're afraid they'll come to discover that they're wrong and be forced to change their minds. But by failing to evaluate the assumptions of our beliefs, we risk imposing wrong and perhaps even dangerous beliefs upon others as well as ourselves. Our beliefs matter, and not just in how our beliefs shape and form or influence us, but also in how they motivate us to act and the impact we may have in the world as a consequence of the beliefs we hold. Everyone, and me especially, holds some wrong beliefs. However, what's important and ultimately what separates people is the degree or length to which one is willing to go in probing one's beliefs to uncover what are the underlying assumptions upon which one's beliefs rest. I was taught that philosophy is a subject devoted to evaluating arguments and constructing theories. Philosophy involves step-by-step reasoning, which is integral to philosophical inquiry and important for how we acquire and change our beliefs, and so now, to demonstrate, I'll share just one of the many occasions when I discovered that I was wrong about an important belief. Like almost everyone else, I believe that murder is wrong. I believe it's wrong because the act of murder is a violation of another person's right to life. That said, I also believe that the death penalty was a justified and appropriate punishment for murderers. However, after some careful reasoning about these two beliefs, I realized that capital punishment is in essence just state-sanctioned murder, and that I held contradictory positions. The proposition that murder is wrong is either true or it is false. Logically, it can't be both wrong and right, depending on who gets to carry it out. Murder is wrong no matter who is doing the murdering. So, now here's an argument against capital punishment. People have the right to life, murderers are people, therefore, murderers have the right to life. Though some people may justifiably describe some murderers as monsters, I think everyone will agree that, at the end of the day, murderers are still just people. What some people may disagree about is whether people have the right to life or any rights at all, but I haven't yet heard anyone provide a convincing argument for why we should think otherwise, so I'm inclined to think that this is a compelling argument and hope you do too. The terrifying part of this experience is that when I reflect back to a time when I believed that the death penalty was a justified and appropriate punishment, I can recall a recent case in Toronto in which someone weaponized their vehicle, drove on the sidewalk, and indiscriminately murdered a number of people. It was a horrifying and abhorrently disgusting act, which I thought merited the death penalty. That is to say that if circumstances were different such that Canada had not abolished the death penalty, and I was a member of the jury, I'm concerned that I would have given this individual the death penalty and been morally responsible for his execution, and in effect been a murderer myself. Those people who think philosophy is useless may be concerned that philosophizing will make them feel less certain about the beliefs they hold, or afraid of being wrong or recognizing uncomfortable truths about themselves, like with how I realized that my belief that murder is wrong, while also advocating for the death penalty, made me capable of committing the very thing which I oppose. However, an emotional disturbance of discovering that one is wrong about some belief should be preferable over leaving some harmful impact upon others in the world because one refused or neglected their duty to evaluate their own beliefs and assumptions. And in my case, 
It helped me to become more certain, not less, in my belief that murder is wrong. As Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And finally, I'd like to share one more experience as some encouragement. So being located in the Northeast, we do experience the occasional blizzard, and visibility can get down to mere meters, making getting around a whole lot more difficult. One year, during a blizzard, as I was heading across front campus to get to my next class, I suddenly heard someone in the distance calling out, Hey! Hey, you! Of course, with teary icicles forming around my eyelashes from the wind blowing in my face, I'm thinking, good God, why me? But I stopped and replied, You talking to me? A voice boomed back, Yeah, you, please. So I replied, Can I help you? The voice echoed in the distance, Yeah, do you know what time it is? <laughs> and now, as I'm freezing my face off, and my inner John McEnroe is thinking, you cannot be serious. My desire to just help him out quickly won the battle for what to do next, but because I don't wear a watch and didn't have my phone on me, I thought, well, I'm of no use. But then I remembered that, wait a second, yeah, I do know the time, and in fact, I know the exact time. So I called out, you know what, man, wherever you have to be, and whatever you have to do, now's the time. The time is always now. Suddenly, I heard ice cracking and crunching snow as footsteps began to approach me. A shape appeared in the distance, which turned into the figure of a large man. He looked at me sternly and raised his hand to point at me. I raised my hands as if to say, please don't shoot me. He then said, oh my god, dude, you're right, that's true. In the middle of a field, in the midst of a whirling blizzard, we both just burst into laughter. And that was probably the warmest, weird, good experience I've had during a blizzard. But anyway, as the lesson suggests, I'd like to encourage everyone that now is the time for philosophy. And so I'll end with a quote from the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, who said, Let no one be slow to seek wisdom when he is young, nor weary in the search of it when he has grown old. For no age is too early or too late for the health of the soul. Some further reading recommendations for those interested to learn more. There's Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, an important Stoic text, and the introduction and commentary to the book are provided by our guest, Professor Christopher Gill. How to Live a Good Life, A Guide to Choosing Your Personal Philosophy. This book covers many interesting philosophical traditions and features an essay on Taoism by our guest, Professor Robin Wang. Philosophy as a Way of Life by Pierre Hadot, who was an early advocate of that view. How to Be an Epicurean, also called a Pleasure Principle for editions sold in the UK, covers Epicurean philosophy and is by our guest Catherine Wilson. And lastly, there is an Intro to Philosophy text, which I'm particularly enamored with, Eliot Sober's Core Questions in Philosophy. It left an indelible mark on how I think about philosophy and gave me what is, I think, a strong foundation. So I'd recommend it to anyone with a serious interest in studying philosophy at the university level. I'd like to again thank our guests, Marta Faustino, Christopher Gill, Catherine Wilson, and Robin Wang. I appreciate you all for taking the time to come on the show and for sharing your insights with us. I'd like to also bring listeners' attention to some of the organizations doing great work in promoting philosophy as a way of life. There's Modern Stoicism. They recently held a Stoicon, which I attended and found to be very informative. Next week, starting on Monday, October the 18th, they're holding their Stoic Week, which is a sort of hands-on workshop aimed at anyone seeking to incorporate Stoic practices into their daily lives and routines. There's also the University of Notre Dame, which is the host of the Philosophy as a Way of Life Network. And I'd also like to acknowledge the tremendous support of the Mellon Foundation, who are one of, if not the largest, supporters of the arts and humanities in America, including generously donating to the Philosophy as a Way of Life initiative at the University of Notre Dame. Special thanks goes out to Professor Laura Mueller and Professor Ben Song, as well as the blogger Hiram Crespo, who worked with me behind the scenes and whose help made the show a lot better than it would have been otherwise, so for that I'm grateful to them. Coming up next on News Hour is a review of some of the worthwhile Intro to Philosophy texts available on the market. Some of them take different approaches and will appeal to different people based on their needs and budget. I'd also like to quickly plug my new blog, Bonne Raison, which I'll post new blog posts to every Monday morning starting next week. And for updates to both News Hour and my blog, you can follow me on social media. And finally, NewsHour listens to its listeners. If you have some constructive feedback on how we can improve the show, please get in touch with us through social media. Our DMs are open. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and see you all next time.